Paul was good enough to send me along a few suggestive questions um, to try and focus my mind on some issues that will be concerning you over the next day or two or three. Um, and let me address some of those in broad terms. Uh, the first was really about the role of civil society, and I think it's uh, interesting that I'm coming from Shanghai, where civil society there have begun forming um, disability law centers, disability law research clinics, um, with a view to not only doing research and making proposals for change, but actually taking cases, particularly at the lower level of the court system, and they're proving quite successful so far. So it's a very interesting initiative, and I guess it parallels uh, what's happening in Sweden. Let me back up just a little bit, um, because Paul asked me about the role of civil society in drafting the UN Disability Convention, and the answer is very straightforward. The treaty would not have happened without very active input from civil society around the world. Um, disability civil society groups basically had their act together much earlier than other civil society groups. For example, you're probably aware there's a draft treaty on the rights of older people being looked at at the moment in the UN system. And I would say that disability civil society was light years ahead of where the NGOs are and the DPOs are for uh, older people. Partly that was accident. Partly that was due to, for example, the major funding program in Europe, the Helios program, that um, accidentally, but nevertheless fortuitously, brought together disparate civil society groups from around Europe, from Athens, from Oslo, from Dublin, from Berlin, who over a period of a decade and a half began to learn a common language began to reframe disability issues away from social policy and toward justice as expressed in human rights. Uh, I think it was very symptomatic that at one of the opening sessions, the drafting sessions of the treaty, um, one government mooted uh, having economic, social and cultural rights to the fore of this treaty, and one of the global NGOs got up and said, no, that's part of the problem. It might be part of the solution, but as currently crafted, it's part of the problem. What they were getting at was that the social framing of disability um, ended up perversely entrapping people with disabilities and that a completely new framing was required. That didn't mean that economic and social supports and rights didn't have a role to play but it did mean you had to reconceptualize what social support and social policy was for. And what it was for was for in underpinning the freedom and the autonomy and the dignity of the individual. Um, so that was a very interesting um, experience, let's put it that way, in the drafting of the convention. Um, during the first ad hoc session, uh, a resolution was passed. Most of us didn't take much notice of it at the time that allowed civil society be present in the room, in the drafting chamber, to speak after states had spoken. Um, that literally changed the pitch because thereafter, all of the global NGOs and many, many national NGOs were actually present in the room. And at the outset of the process, states didn't know what to do, had no instructions from capital, didn't know how to engage with civil society. But the beauty was that at the end of the process, states were competing with each other to understand better the justice stroke human rights dimension to disability and to frame it better in the actual draft text. So this did not detract from the objectivity of the process, but it added an edge to that process that otherwise simply would not have been there. And the old slogan that we use, that nothing about us without us, is now a legal requirement in the Convention, uh, both with respect to engagement in general policy matters. You would almost say at a European level, what we're working toward is co-production of law and public policy with civil society, uh, as well as in the provisions on monitoring the Convention, which are particularly important and requires new working methods, particularly from...
human rights commissions, ombudsmen, and so on and so forth. So I would say that the presence of civil society during the birth of the convention was one of the keys to its success. And the ongoing engagement of civil society at local level, at regional and national level, and now at the international level, is critically important in maintaining the visibility of the issues and, as it were, the pressure for change. I should say, uh, to me, um, I'm not really a traditional lawyer in the sense that I think process is as important as substance. To me, the key of the Convention is Article 33, which requires almost a theory of change, a triangulation process of change involving government, civil society and national human rights institutions and getting that triangle of change to work properly is really the key to you owning the convention in Sweden or in Belgium or in South Africa or wherever um, and in that triangulation of change the voice the collective voice of people with disabilities is absolutely crucial it cannot be done without um, Paul asked me that in my capacity as the director of our Centre on Disability Law and Policy, whether I see a need for such centres in the future uh, right across Europe. And I would say we only have about three or four in Europe. Um, and indeed, in the United States, there's some experts in particular law schools, but they don't necessarily have centres attached to them. What they generally do is set up disability law clinics that assist civil society in bringing uh, test cases or in supporting cases that are already underway. Uh, I have to say there, there are some restrictions in Europe on doing that, but nevertheless the evolution of these clinics, which you can see popping up every day, is really important to support civil society. First of all in framing how it approaches an issue from the perspective of rights and law, and secondly in pursuing their test cases to probe um, the limits of the law, the outer limits of the law. I don't see this as binary opposition to public policy and to the state. I see it as a necessary way of actually growing and deepening our understanding of the requirements of the law. There are maybe some cultural reasons why there is um, hesitancy about that in some places, but more and more I think uh, governments are seeing that as an equally constructive contribution to the evolution of law and public policy as direct participation in the drafting of law and public policy. Um, I think what's crucial in the evolution of these disability law centers is that they must be organically rooted in the community and connected with civil society and informed by civil society. One of our colleagues in Australia does a lot of work on participatory research methodologies whereby people with disabilities do their own research and come up with their own issues and then, as it were, work constructively with the disability law centres and others around Europe. There's not enough of them around Europe. There's only four or five as yet. Uh, we do collaborate very actively with each other and um, are always open to new uh, entities springing up. So we welcome your initiative greatly in Sweden. Um, let me just, uh, by the way, that's my dog if you hear him scratching at the door. Um, we do have a disability law summer school. It's now entering its 10th year, uh, the next year, 2017. Um, the idea for that is very simple. Um, knowledge tends to float self-referentially in elite circles. We wanted ways of democratizing the knowledge and to making sure that that knowledge reached the people who actually needed it. Um, so the summer school last year, for example, attracted um, approximately 47 nationalities and 160 participants, and it's fairly well supported by outside philanthropy um, and development aid programs. So I would very much encourage you to, to think along those lines. Uh, colleagues in China are beginning to think along those lines as well as in Africa and if you do put on something like that you should I think take a, a, a leaf from our book and make sure that everything is online in terms of the actual presentations, the videos of the presentations, 
So people who can't make it, people up in Umeå and Vesterbotten who can't make your conference, will be able at one click to actually see what's going on and learn from themselves. And you can't discount the power of those ideas. Uh, something can be said in a lecture that inspires people to push an issue or even take a case. Uh, we had one participant from St. Petersburg some years ago who promptly went home and took a case against his local municipality. I don't know how it worked out, uh, but there are lots of unforeseen and positive beneficial effects of putting on such uh, things. We tend to um, put a lot of information in it on just the basics so that people can tool themselves up from A, B to C. We also tend to have a thematic focus um, and last year it was the role of civil society in processes of change and next year we think it's going to be on psychosocial disabilities and the UN CRPD. Um, so another question Paul put very usefully is do we need national laws to transpose the glittering generalities of the treaty into local environments and the answer of that is straightforwardly absolutely. Um, the, uh, one of the ideas in drafting the convention is that there would be regional arrangements and that national action plans would have to be adopted. Um, unfortunately, that, that did not make it into the face of the treaty, but I think it's implicit in the logic of the treaty. One of the things the framers are very much alive to is that it's kind of useless having an instrument out there in the ether, in the UN system, you have to own it, you have to bring it home, you have to internalize it. And that's why I keep coming back to the importance of process, theories of change, and Article 33 in the Convention itself. I would even say that's more important than substance. The way you bring it home, how you inform domestic processes of change, is really where it's at, I think, in making it um, real and tangible for people on the ground. Um, what about uh, the question, um, case law and how I see it developing in Europe and what the possibilities are. I think if you asked me that question, Paul, 10 years ago, I would give you a pretty depressing answer uh, because the European Court of Justice didn't really understand the e employment directive. Um, they, didn't have the, they didn't bring to the table the correct framework of reference and certainly the European Court of Human Rights was if I can put it politely, probably in the dark ages in terms of disability. That's changed utterly and for the better. And the European Court of Human Rights is slowly and steadily incorporating the framework of reference of the UNCRPD into its analysis of issues like legal capacity, um, inclusive education and so forth. Uh, so that's quite a turnaround. And I would say there's a lot of space yet to utilize the European Court of Human Rights for disability issues. Don't forget the Committee on Social Rights, which implements the Council of Europe's Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which has an excellent track record on disability issues <coughs> and has no problem requiring states to put resources behind um, their rhetoric because that's the essence of economic, social and cultural rights. I'm not sure if Sweden or Swedish citizens can lodge collective complaints before that body, uh, but it's uh, don't just think of the European Court of Human Rights, think also of the Committee on Social Rights. The Court of Justice of the European Union has, I think, come on in leaps and bounds. I guess your problem there is that the material scope of the relevant European legislation is still quite narrow and of course there's a lot of struggle at European level um, involving a lot of civil society groups to broaden that material base to ensure that our directives um, cover all aspects of life and not just uh, the narrow field of employment important though that is. Um, do I think lawyers across Europe understand these possibilities, these argumentative possibilities, uh, probably the answer is there's an increasing number of them who do. Um, there is now almost a bar of European level lawyers who specialize in taking these kinds of cases and who certainly, if they're not directly engaged, can be consulted. I'm thinking particularly of Robin Allen QC in London, 
who takes a lot of these cases before the European tribunals. Um, there could be a lot more training in bar associations across Europe, uh, but training is one thing. Actually, internalizing the framework of reference is really the trick. Um, and sometimes that can happen in a split second. Sometimes it can take a lot more of um, training. Um, but uh, I think we could, we could improve um, the intensity and the level of training across Europe for, for lawyers. That's one reason why summer schools are so interesting, because they bring together civil society, government people, policy makers, people with disability, families and advocates by formulating laws. Paul also uh, asked me to talk a little bit about that. Um, I, I personally take the view that um, one of the problems in the past was the absence of collective voice in the policy making and legislative uh, domains. Um, and I think one shouldn't just look at the treaty as putting forward a set of norms according to which we measure a gap in terms of, let's say, inclusive education in Sweden, and then try and force people to close that gap. <coughs> One should also view the convention as a way of tackling the process by which laws are made. Uh, because what's the point of changing one or two bad laws? if the process of making those bad laws continues in place. You're simply going to replicate the same thing into the future. So having that presence of voice at the outset of thinking about new laws, new policies, is really, really crucial. It doesn't mean that your view will end up being the dominant view in the legislation. There's no guarantee that what you come forward with is actually going to be expressed 100% in the legislation because nothing without us, about us without us doesn't mean that everything has to be dictated by us, but it does mean there has to be meaningful active participation in the drafting of public policy and legislation. Um, <clears throat> what about civil society developing its own legal expertise? Now the Americans are particularly good at this and have been good at this over the last 30 or 40 years. I think the disability rights movement there took its cue from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and they had a ready-made kind of menu to work from. Uh, we don't. I think it's fair to say that civil society is still somewhat distant from lawyers and legal advocates uh, and so forth, and there are many, many cultural reasons for that. Um, I do think that in each European country there's several <coughs> members of the bar who are very open to working with civil society and there certainly are very eminent legal academics in your universities including in Sweden and I'm thinking of the Raoul Wallenberg Institute here who are extremely open um, to engaging with civil society so I think there's Europe is in a new situation now I think we're there are many more possibilities than, than they were five or ten years ago and uh, I think you'd be surprised at how open at the bar and um, and the the academic community are. Uh, by the way, a lot of some of the leading Supreme Court decisions in the U.S. are led by leading legal academics in association with civil society. I'm thinking of Arlene Meyerson in California, as well as um, some others on the East Coast whose names escape me now. Michael Waterstone, for example in California, in Loyola Law School, um, and the others, <laughs> the names will come to me shortly. Um, <clears throat> should civil society lie back and rely on the goodwill of others? No. I think the whole point of the conception of how we change processes of change in the convention is that the voice of people with disabilities is front and center. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean undermining a social consensus. This doesn't necessarily mean uh, changing um, positive outcomes of a social policy orientation in the past, but it's just a new kind of partnership in the co-production of laws and public policies that are directly going to affect you. Um, one of the interesting innovations that comes to mind uh, is that in British Columbia, in Canada, if a new policy initiative is being 
thought of, then the policymakers, the senior civil servants who are engaged in that process, must engage in professional empathy. And that means they spend maybe three weeks living with the people who are going to be directly affected by the outcome of whatever policy conclusions they're going to come to. So it isn't just people with disabilities moving toward the policy process, it's also the policy process itself changing to create more space and to think through and gain through the implications of their choices for the, the lived lives of people with disabilities, as well as others. It's not just people with disabilities. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, yeah, w one other point that Paul probed me on is, um, you know, how deep do ideas of non-discrimination and this new equality framing of disability go in Europe? Uh, I, again, if you asked me that question five years ago, I would say it's paper thin. But I think it's, um, I think there's a lot of depth now to it, and you'll see that in the kind of journal articles being written, and you'll see that in the kind of legislation being proposed. One thing I would say, though, is that the treaty goes beyond equality. It, its conception of equality is quite... Um, interesting. It's an evolution from traditional conceptions of equality. Um, Otni Arnardotter from Iceland calls this um, multi-dimensional uh, accumulated disadvantage conceptions of equality. That's a bit of a mouthful, but it's a really interesting way of thinking about the convention and the issues it addresses. But I think it goes beyond equality because one of the things the drafters were keen to put their finger on was the invisibility of people with disabilities. So it wasn't just a case of using equality to bulldoze away barriers and so forth into the mainstream. It was the actual personhood of people with disabilities was always called into question. So you might think of the convention really as a visibility project. How can it unmask the person behind the disability? And that's why I think uh, Article 12 on legal capacity, legal personhood, and Article 19 on the presence of the person in the community, independent and community living, are absolutely crucial to the Convention. These are articles that go deeper than the traditional, let's say, Anglo-American conception of non-discrimination or equality. And that's a unique feature, and I think um, a lot of lawyers get that. A lot of lawyers instinctively get um, how personhood issues are front